Hi, so it's um, lovely to be here. So um, I'm Helen Santini and I work with the Huntington Seas Association in England and Wales. So I've worked with um, people with juvenile HD for close to 20 years now um, for the association as their specialist advisor. Um, and for me and those who know me, juvenile HD has been a passion for a very long time. So to see a series of sessions like this is very exciting for me. Just a little disclaimer, if you're here to see Josh's film, you might have to wait until my second session, so just so I don't disappoint anyone. Um, it is coming, but a bit later on. Um, so I think this session is hopefully going, we'll probably pick up on a lot of the things that Oliver mentioned, um, but just in a, maybe a slightly different take on it. Um, so what, what it's based on, so um, some years ago now, but we did a, a some, a couple of pieces of research looking at the impact of Huntington disease, juvenile Huntington disease on the, on the family. So what I'm trying to pull out, so we started off um, with some research in the UK and then followed that up with research across um, Europe. Um, so some of it's based on that and then sort of um, uh, expanded with just the experiences, the, the conversations and the support um, uh, with families over the years as well. So I think the point that will come across kind of throughout this um, talk is that really it's, you have to think of the context of juvenile Huntington's and having Huntington's but at a different age. Obviously you're looking at um, a developing brain, um, so having a progressive condition at the same time as when, uh, the same time that your brain is developing is a different situation. But also it's a very different stage in someone's life. Um, we all know about, in terms of developing independence and autonomy, peer relations, um, and just being a young person. Um, and in my second talk, I'll pick up on a lot more on that in terms of transitions as well. Um, but also, I just want to think about, again, it's a different family context. Um, and so often, we might be thinking of um, a parent supporting their, um, their child, young adult, um, and it's, it's a very isolating experience. We, for all of you, you'll know Huntington's disease is isolating, but juvenile Huntington's disease is, is that much um, more isolating. And as Oliver mentioned, you know, we are also thinking, you know, there have been experiences where you've got someone who also has, has juvenile HD but has children, for example. So it's a slightly different um, sort of family context, um, which will have implications for the whole family. Again, think just... I pick up a few times in terms of kind of siblings as well um, and their experiences as well. So as I mentioned, we started off with a study in the UK, again some years ago now, talking to, we talk, spoke to 12 families um, about the impact of juvenile Huntington's disease. We then extended that to four European countries, um, including Holland, Italy, Poland and Sweden. Um, and I don't think Nando's in the room, but you may have seen him around, um, was involved with that in Italy. Um, and I think what we were trying to do there is look at um, where the experiences were just across the board. So different healthcare systems, different maybe cultural, um, uh, different cultures, um, and try and pick out some of the themes that, were, that families were talking about across the board. And things do move on, things have changed. I will pick up in terms of things like connections and the things that have happened with social media and even since COVID, how things have changed. So, but I think it's a useful place to start in terms of some of the, the themes that came ac up across the board. So the first thing that I think people talked about was those early signs and those very sort of early signs that they spotted through to diagnosis. So as Oliver was mentioning, a lot of the early signs might be really ambiguous. You know, it might be something like those changes in behaviour um, or just maybe struggling at school, for example, um, which can, it's particularly when you've got children who are changing all the time, can be really hard to, to pin down and say, actually, this is something that's going on. But I certainly have conversations with lots of people where they know Huntington's is in the family, they see some, some changes like that going on, and, of course, the first thing that they worry about is maybe could this be Huntington's. For a lot of people, for the vast majority, that probably doesn't... It turns out to be something else. 
Um, but obviously, with this situation, these we were talking to people um, where it had turned out to be Huntington's. Um, so they talked about some of those early symptoms. But actually, I think what was really interesting is where people were just picking up, even if they didn't have a family history of HD, they were picking up, actually, there's, some, this, there's something here that just didn't feel right. You know, the parent was saying, I knew... I know my child, and I knew something wasn't right. Perhaps where they'd lost contact with um, the, the partner um, who had, and, and didn't even know Huntington's was in the family, for example. But I think what was really clear is that in those situations where it had turned out to be Huntington's, there'd been this really, in some cases, a really long delay in, in terms of getting to a diagnosis. Um, and I know Oliver picked up on some of this before as well. And actually, families sometimes felt very unsupported during that time. So I think certainly when I'm having conversations with people, the message I'm often really trying to give is, you know, I am listening to you. You know, you can come back to me at any time. You know, we don't necessarily have to have a diagnosis. You know, I think a lot of the support that we can give is maybe managing the different symptoms. And that we can do a lot of the time. We can do putting in the support that we would give whether it was Huntington's, juvenile Huntington's or, or something else. Um, but really uh, trying to give that sort of maybe offering follow-up, um, which is what Oliver was talking about in terms of maybe redoing um, assessments over time, um, just gives that opportunity to have another chat with um, the family and, and in terms of the support. So this is one of the quotes from um, a family. Um, so I told them right from the start about Huntington's and they ignored it. And finally he got diagnosed with dyspraxia but I still wasn't happy because he was doing really badly. I just ended up saying, my life is terrible. And he said it was my parenting skills. A mum knows when there's something wrong. And I think for me, I think what this, I really hear in this is that sense of, actually the, that parent felt really blamed for what was going on. And I think it's really important. That's where that sort of, that messaging of, actually we might not be going, and we might not be um, look, jumping to juvenile HD straight away, but, we are listening and we are supporting you. Um, I know that Oliver picked up on this as well. Um, so again, just a reminder, obviously the predictive test isn't usually available to those under 18 years old. So in terms of diagnosing juvenile HD, we'd be, we can be using the test in a diagnostic way. But as Oliver said, that's very much just part of the story. Um, you know, people will have the gene whether or not those symptoms at that point it doesn't tell you that the symptoms at that point in time are caused by Huntington's um, and it can be really difficult you know with those those sort of subtle changes going on um, and I think we also have to recognize that sometimes in these situations the different people in the in the situation may have very different views about um, you know what's going on and how they feel about that as well so the other thing, just to pick up on, because obviously it, in terms of talking about behaviour, so just to make it clear, this doesn't happen with every child with juvenile HD, but as many of you will know with Huntington's, um, we can see changes in behaviour, and we can see that with juvenile HD as well. But I think in terms of thinking about where it differs, I think it's also that we have that extra element to try and tease apart. So often there is a bit of teasing apart of you know, what might be Huntington's and what might be about the... Um, a sort of a reaction um, to the things that are going on in someone's life. But then also with, with younger people, you know, there can be those changes in behaviour anyway. It's, there's lots going on at that point in time. So you just have this extra element to try and tease apart that can be, make it a bit harder. Um, the second theme that I think really came across strongly um, across all of the, the research um, and definitely something that's echoed, and I'm sure people will, will resonate with people, is that it is isolating, and I know I mentioned that, and I think, you know, lots of people will be feeling as they come to this conference, you know, reaching out and connecting, that sense of that breaking down that isolation. Um, and as I said before, particularly with juvenile HD, you have that extra um, level of isolation. Um, and I, this was a, a quote from um, the research, you've created an island, and I thought that was, again, a really interesting wording um, because I think there is this sort of element that, you know, it's hard to, difficult for other people to really understand what you're going through. Um, 
But equally, sometimes it can be really difficult for people to ask for help. I think a lot of families will feel that they don't want to burden other people, other, maybe other members of the family. We have to recognise that a lot of people might be in the situation where Huntington's has impacted um, on the wider family support um, at some point or in some way, um, which might make it might limit who, who they have for support. Um, and in terms of um, the young person with juvenile HD, some of the things that came up were obviously that in terms of isolation um, and was around that sort of increased when you're, as you're becoming sort of increasingly um, maybe dependent on family members. And also communication difficulties was one of the, the things that came up and people talked about. Um, and I also just want to recognise and mention around siblings as well, obviously, you know, in terms of um, feeling isolated as well. So here's a couple of um, quotes from the research as well. So where you've got Huntington's, you've got a parent affected. So you've not only got the fact that you're looking after a child, but you're doing it alone. In my case, I lost my parents many years ago and there's very little family around me. So I'm sort of doing this alone. Um, and that echoes what I was saying in terms of kind of finding it, diff you know, finding it difficult to have people to pull on for support. And she was going further and further away from her pals because she couldn't understand and she couldn't react as quickly as them. You say anything to her and you have to wait 10 minutes before she'll answer. So she's standing back. Um, and again, in terms of kind of some of the dynamics of what's going on, um, that echoes that. And then another theme that was a very common theme across the board, and is probably no surprise to anyone, um, but was around kind of people's knowledge and understanding. And I think what I try and emphasise here is that people might be aware of Huntington, juvenile Huntington's disease. They might understand that that's, the, that's what's going on in the family. Um, but they might not really understand. They might not really get it. And I'm sure that will resonate and echo with a lot of people. Um, I think the other element to this that came across really strongly was that families became the experts um, and took on a lot of responsibility. And again, I'm sure it will resonate and echo with a lot of people. Um, but I think, you know, that has two sides. In, to, one, to one extent, we've got to recognise that expertise um, because people are the experts in um, juvenile HD in most cases and, and their life as well. Um, but that does place a lot of demands. And I can remember talking to one family, for example, where they're taking on a, a real responsibility in terms of deciding medications and what medications to use. Um, and they felt the real pressure in those sort of moments when they had to decide, you know, do we give, what amount of medication do we give? So there was a sense of real responsibility um, that, that families felt. So I think we need to be um, recognising that expertise but supporting families with that demands. I think we also, you know, I'll put my hands up as well, none of us are really experts on juvenile HD. Experts in juvenile HD really don't exist. Um, pockets of knowledge are sort of spread around the place, but that doesn't mean that people can't offer support. Um, so I think it's about being honest and saying, actually, you know, this is the limits of my knowledge, but what's most important is listening to the family. We don't necessarily need to be an expert, but we can support people with whatever, and actually um, they need help with. And actually some of the most... Um, you know, the help, most helpful support sometimes is just someone who's, who's sort of willing to be there and do that, that work and support. So again, here's a quote. So we used to go to accident and emergency if he'd fallen or something, and you'd say what he'd got, and they would not know, oh, I think I've read about that somewhere, what is it? And then you'd have to explain to them all what it was. They'd get quite cross with him, and I used to think, well, the kid can't help it, you know. I've told you about this, go away and learn about it. Nobody knows hardly anything about it at all, you know, particularly the juvenile side. And again, I think you can hear in that quote about, you know, that sense of, yes, they knew that there, you know, even accident emergency healthcare professionals, they knew about that there was juvenile HD, but they didn't, that sort of still didn't sort of fully, fully understand. Um, so just um, a sort of an example, one, another sort of context of picking up on that is kind of in terms of support at school. Um, so I think actually support at school um, or in terms of education, actually it can be really quite a challenging environment for young people with juvenile HD. 
Um, it is a really important element for a lot of people. Um, so often it's um, a context where that person gets really great age-appropriate activities um, at um, really great age-appropriate activities, peer support, um, but it can, there are challenges, so schools often need support. I think early um, and full understanding is really important. Um, and I've seen quite a few examples where actually when there are those very subtle changes are happening, it, if that isn't understood as part of the condition, actually it can really put someone off school. Um, and then they might be want, uh, avoiding, for example. So it's really important. And I think once that's, set, once that's happened, it can be really hard to turn around. The earlier changes are made, the better. Um, and flexibility is the key. Um, so, you know, not sticking rigidly to a curriculum, thinking a bit more flexibly around um, kind of what we offer someone. This is, I think, I don't know how we're doing for time, so I might just sort of skip through this, but just a list of various things that can be helpful um, in the school context. Um, and I'm happy to share this after if anyone wants to have a bit more of a look at that. So just kind of summarising really what we were saying about support for families. So as I said, I think the important thing is listening to people and being honest about the limits of knowledge. And this isn't rocket science. You know, this is often kind of around good, good care. Um, so having someone who's coord who coordinates the support and is consistent um, and that good communication is important. Um, and access to services with expertise. Um, so linking people up with, you know, with someone who has um, expertise in whatever area. So it might not be, it might be a Huntington specialist, but equally it might be a paediatrician, for example, who can be that sort of person who might have the expertise in terms of child health, for example. Um, it might be a, a, a special centre of excellence, a specialist clinic um, in terms of Huntington's. Support to manage transition um, and find appropriate services. And I'll pick up on transition later in, in my talk later where I talk more specifically about that. Um, people really wanted respite as well. Um, so that chance to have a break. And again, I'll pick up on this a bit later. But what's really important here, I think, is, is it's something that is fun for the young person. So it's something that is age appropriate because it needs to be a win-win for everyone. Um, and peer support and online tools. And I think this is one area where, where things have changed. You know, I think there, is m m there are many more options than you know, even a few years ago um, in terms of our ways to connect. And just us all being here is a, is a prime example of that. Um, so when he, a mental health nurse, walked through the door, I think we were just that frustrated and that angry that we just, both of us, we just verbally attacked him and I said, what do you know about Huntington's? And he said, actually, not a lot. He was so honest with us, and he was really good, and he stuck in there. He stayed the course, didn't he? And I think this, just for me, this quote epitomises what I was saying in terms of what the support that we're, we're looking for. And it would also be nice to, to know of other people, so you could, like, at least, especially when she's having a really bad moment, you could say, oh, well, I know it's not just me. <laughs> And again, I think this just really epitomises what us all coming together is about for me. Um, and um, I love this quote. So just to mention, so in the UK, um, we have a family weekend once a year that's been running now for 18 years, um, where families can come together. And if anyone's interested in knowing more about that, I'm aware that this is UK-centric, but I'm very happy to talk to people um, I would love to see it in other places as well. Um, but we usually have about um, 13 families come every year. Um, and I just think it's, for me, it's been so powerful seeing, and the comments that come back, it's always around, you know, it's just people who get it. And again, being here at that conf this conference, I'm sure everyone's feeling a little bit of that as well. Um, but we do um, separate sessions is for the whole family. We have separate sessions for the parents and then separate sessions for activities, fun activities for the young people with juvenile HD. 
Um, over COVID, we started um, monthly online Zoom calls, which again, you know, we'd, I know there are others around, around the world, um, but we would be very welcome. It, is, it can be international because it is, um, it's on Zoom. Um, so if anyone wanted to link in with those, again, they would be very, very welcome. Please just catch me and ask about them. Um, so just to finish, a few resources. So obviously I'm stickered up with Join HD stickers um, and I know Oliver mentioned around Join HD. If you haven't heard of Join HD, please come and have a look at the stall and find out more about it. Um, as Oliver mentioned, it's a registry for people um, with juvenile HD, um, but it's a great resource that we're developing. We've got some pages on our website, hda.org.uk, as have um, HDO, so please look at those. Um, and there are guides on the Huntington Society of America and Huntington, Huntington Society Canada um, websites as well. Um, and again, these are just some of the references if anyone wants to do a bit more reading of the papers that we wrote. Um, but just to finish, um, so this is a film from... Um, that was uh, Families Experiences that HDO um, produced. And I've just taken a short clip just to finish so that um, the last word is from young people with juvenile HD. What did you tell other young people who have HD? Just to stay positive, just to stay positive and and embrace all the good things and, and, and to do all the fun things you can do. Just stay strong and believe in yourselves. So, um, if anyone wants to catch me, I know I've met um, quite a lot of you, but if anyone, I haven't, you know, obviously, I might not have had the opportunity, so I'd love to please pop by and say hello, um, but thank you.